It's always amazing that we serve a God who will never be shaken. No matter what the circumstances are in our life, no matter what's going on in our world, no matter the challenges that are around us in our, our daily lives, we serve a God and we, we praise a God, we give thanks to a God who will never be shaken. This morning as we come to His Word again, we know that His Word is true. And His Word is accurate and His Word is full of power for each one of us today. And as we look to open up our hearts, as we open up His Word, we pray to our God who will not be shaken. There's nothing going on in your world that doesn't surprise Him. There's no challenges that are going on in our situation, in our circumstances that He doesn't know about. So I wonder if we can invite God this morning right into the midst of our circumstances, right into the midst of our personal situations. Can we bow our heads just for a moment as we start this morning? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're a God who indeed, who cannot be shaken, who will never change, who's promised that you're always the same yesterday, and you are today, and you always will be. Father, we thank you that you've been faithful to each one of us, as we've already been reminded. We go back and we say thank you as we look back at everything that you've done. Father, you've been so kind. And here we are today, Lord, in this room. We pray, Father, as we look to hear from you today, Lord, that again, you're immutable qualities of being everywhere and all-powerful and all-knowing would be revealed to each one of us today as you speak right into our personal situations. Father, the challenges that we have, the difficulties that we, we go through, Lord, the fears and concerns that we have. Father, we thank you that you are the rock on which we stand. You're the strong tower that we go to in our times of difficulty. And Father, it's from there we ask you to speak to us today. Lord, that your word will speak to each one, Father. Everything else that's around that, Lord, you would remove that you want to speak and say what you have to say. We pray, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen, Amen. Fantastic. Smile at somebody as you take a seat this morning. Great to see you. As we said, everybody is following somebody. Everybody is... is pursuing something in life and everybody is is pursuing either something or somebody and we started this this journey a few weeks together of walking with Jesus who knows where we're heading in our life who knows where the trajectory of our our life will be taking us uh, I remember that we were on a, a a hunt for a hotel and we put in the I thought I'd put in the right coordinates into Satnav Sally, and she began telling me, proceed to the route uh, and follow her instructions. We did so for quite some time. I thought we were following in the right direction. I thought we were heading in the right way. I thought that the destination of where we would end would be where we intended to end, and we, we kept on following, and everything she said, keep on going, we kept on going. But when we arrived, at, and she said, you've arrived at your destination, and we were at the gate of a farmer's field, I realized I had not been following the right voice. Contrast that, however, with many years ago when I was still doing medicine, I'd been invited to, to contribute to a, a, a conference in Barcelona, and I'd never been to Barcelona before, and I flew there, and at the other end, I was going to be meet, met by a driver, and he was going to, to have you know, the, these things up with your name on it, and uh, I was, came out to the, the, the arrivals place, and there were many men there, many women there, with cars with lots of names on it, and I'm looking for which one am I supposed to follow, and there was one, it had I-A-I-N next to it, uh, and I thought, I, that must be me. And I looked at him, and he looked at me, and he said, Senor Lane. I said, no, it's, it's Ian, but I'll let you off with that. Senor Lane. And he said, mi nombre es Ricardo. And then he said, come follow me. And I followed this man through Barcelona Airport. And we went through this door and that door and that, that passageway and this passageway. We avoided this and we avoided that. And we arrived out where there was a whole bunch of medics all together. We were all going to partner together in this conference. And there we were. And I thought, now that's following in the right direction. That's being led in the right direction. Where somebody comes and says, here I am, follow me. And we're looking at Mark's gospel for these few weeks. Just the first eight chapters as Jesus finds himself around Galilee, the lake at the top of Israel. And Jesus is there and he's traveling around and he's introducing himself and introducing the journey and the invitation to follow him. And Mark's gospel, as we saw last week, begins as, a, as, a, as it were a, a mobile story of Jesus journeying from place to place. Jesus emerges on the first day and he says, the time has come, the kingdom of God is near and it's time for you to repent and believe. It's time for you to make some shifts in your life in response to the reality that I've come. 
And right from the start of Mark's gospel, we, we follow Jesus through his journey from that first day right through until his last day when he says on the, from the cross, it is finished. The price has been paid in full. And we wonderfully remember that this morning. But Jesus, I believe, wants to take all of us in this room today on that journey. He wants to say to every one of us in the room, individually and collectively, come, follow me. Come and walk with me. Come on the journey of life with me. And we saw in Mark 1.17 where Jesus, in front of a group of, of reasonably ordinary men, young people, says to them, come, follow me, and I will change you. I will make you from being fishers of marine life to being fishers of real life men and women. And he invites you and me to become, as it were, exactly the same. He calls us disciples. And Jesus invites you and me on a discipleship journey this morning, a journey to become like him, a journey to do what he does, and a journey to fulfill what he asks you and me to fill. So I trust that we've been walking this last week with Jesus. I don't know if anybody actually did the 20-mile walk this week as we were last week at Capernaum, taking the 20 miles around in Galilee, and we thank the media team for putting some stuff out to encourage us. If you put your, your phones on this week, we're going another 20 miles, as Jesus' whole journey probably up around Galilee was maybe 100, 200 miles. So today we're around the seashore, the lakeside of Galilee, and we're in Mark chapter 2. So if you've got a Bible, you can take it with, me, with you, and let's read together. Mark chapter 2, verses 13 and 17, and then we're going to f finish off with a few verses from Mark chapter 3. Once again, it says, Jesus went out beside the lake, and a large cloud crowd came to him, and he began to teach him. And as he walked along the lakeside, he saw Levi, or Matthew, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. Matthew got up and followed him. And while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were now many who followed him. And when the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, hey, why does he eat with the tax collectors and, tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, hey, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but those who are ill. I have come to call not the righteous, but to call sinners. And so soon after this meal, this kind of time where they were having a party together as, as Matthew was celebrating his new journey that he was about to be on, Jesus is confronted with, the, with the, the leaders in the rest of chapter 2 and into the early part of chapter 3. He's confronted by the religious leaders, and they're saying to, to Jesus, what, his disciples, why are you guys feasting and not fasting? And Jesus responds to that, and we're going to look at that in a minute. And the next couple of encounters that you read about, as I would encourage you to do as you go home, I get, both times take place on a Saturday, on the Sabbath, as it was for the, for the Jews at that time. Both encounters are the, by the religious people saying to Jesus, what are you doing, a, what are you doing on a Saturday? What, what is it that you need to do? What is the right thing to do? What are you, all, uh, what are you doing? What's, what's going on on this uh, uh, Sabbath day? Why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you allowing your, your disciples to do what they're doing? And Jesus takes them on and he wants them to understand and lets his apprentices understand. This is what it takes to be a follower of Jesus. And so they continue to walk around the, the, the Galilee kind of coastline, shoreline. And as they do, lots and lots of crowds begin following Jesus once again. There's been some miracles again, as, as Callum was sharing. There's been some miracles, and people now begun crowding around, and to the degree that Jesus has to say to them, it's time out, boys, Let, let's, let's retreat from here. And we join the story again in Mark chapter 3, and verse 13 and 15. It says, Jesus by this time went up on a mountainside and called to him those that he wanted, and they came to him. And he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. So this week, we encounter Jesus again on the move, walking along the shoreline. And this time, we're following Jesus' steps. And he's trying to articulate and say to the disciples, look, if you continue to work with me and walk with me, if you continue to go with me and go on this journey together of, of what it means to become a disciple, then the steps that we want to be taking this week are from followership to partnership. What is it going to take to move you from followership to partnership? And that's where we're going this morning. 
The account begins as Jesus, it says he saw and he encountered this young man, Matthew, a tax collector sitting in a booth by the, the roadside. In Roman, in Roman times in this first century, there were three reasons why the Romans would have raised taxes. One time it was for head tax for people. Second one would have been for land tax that you own something. But the third one was a customs tax, which was between two and 5% of the income and the profit that you got from the sale of what you were selling and moving on. And this would have been what Matthew was doing. He was sitting by the roadside, uh, taking the tax money from the fishermen who were moving their fish to where they needed to get them. And of course, it was an opportunity for him to extort greater amounts of money. He would pay for the ability to do that. He would pay the Romans some money, and everything else that he made was his own. Matthew, when Jesus says, Matthew, follow me, Matthew would have been so amazed and overwhelmed. Matthew would have already excluded himself and disqualified himself from any opportunity, thinking that the rabbi would invite him. Matthew would have already think, thought, there's no way I could understand him or her being invited, but there's no way. You see, he'd already strayed far away from the, the pathway. He'd already strayed far away from any expected reality. Uh, he would no chance in this first century setting of being invited by Jesus. You see, he'd already embraced a life, as it were, of collusion. He'd now moved from his heritage. He'd, he'd given aside and put aside his history and his heritage, and he decided that I'm going to side myself with the Romans, with the Roman oppressors who were oppressing the nation of Israel at that time. And he uh, aligned himself with the world. He said, no, no, you know what? If I align myself with what the world wants to do, I will get a fast buck. I will get more money. And so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to align myself and embrace a life of collusion. I'm going to sell out, as it were, as I'm going to partner with the oppressor. See, being a tax collector in that day was a sign of Roman oppression. And everybody around would have said, you're not part of us. Matthew would have already realized and known that his collusion with the Romans would have meant exclusion from any opportunity of being invited. He would have already embraced not only a life of collusion, but a life of a different identification. Now he was numbered with the tax collectors and sinners. People would have identified him now, put a label on him as unreachable. People would have put a label on him as somebody whose lifestyle was never ever going to be reached for the gospel. Somebody who was never ever going to be communicated with this invitation to come and follow. Somebody who now identified with the Gentiles. He was, as a Jew, that would have been his background, but now he was now ostracized from being a Jew. He was no longer able to, to be a witness in a court of law. He was no longer able to even go into the synagogue, into the place of worship. He was now... Uh, uh, put out and said, no, there's no way. You're now, the label on you is something separate and different. He would have embraced that collusion. He would have already embraced that sense of a different identity. He would have embraced the rejection from his peers. Even his family now would have been rejected also because of the decisions that he'd made to say, I want to make some money. I want to make a fast way in the world. And so I'm going to give up everything that was my history. I'm going to give up the peers and the friends that I have. I'm going to work for the enemy and do the enemy's dealings and tax collecting but the price that he was paying for that both relationally and socially was one of great rejection. And yet it's to that gentleman, it's to that young man that Jesus says, come, follow me. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing as we look inside ourselves today, Jesus comes and he sees him. Jesus comes and he summons him and he says, I invite him and says, come, follow me. I love it. He says, follow me. As we said last week, he didn't ask him to follow a law. He didn't ask him to follow some plans. He didn't ask him to follow some program. He didn't ask him to follow some program of good deeds or best behavior or performance. He says, come and follow me. It's following a person. Salvation, we need to remind ourselves again today, is in a person, not in a program, not in performance, not even in a particular way of living. Salvation is in a, in, in a person, the person of Jesus. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 says, salvation is found in no one else for there is no other name there's no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved Jesus is the only way and Jesus comes and says come follow me it's an invitation it's in a particular tense it was not just a, a one-off moment it was come follow me and keep on following me. And the invitation goes out again to everyone in the room today. Come follow Jesus, but keep on following him. Don't give up. 
Don't give up and don't, don't push him to the side. Keep on following. Maybe you followed him one day and you've drifted back into a, a different way of living. He says to you once again this morning, he wants to remind you again this morning, come follow me. You see, the invite comes to each one of us this morning. So please be encouraged. If you think the invite is never going to come to you, why? Because you've gone to the other side, because you've been part of the dark side, because you've, you've done stuff that you're not uh, uh, proud of, because you, you're full of rejection, because people have labeled you as this or that or the next thing. But for whatever is going on in your life and you think, well, God would never call me. That God would never invite you. I need to remind you today that God, just as he did, as Jesus did when he was passing by, when he saw Matthew and he invited Matthew, he comes to each one of us in this room today. He sees you and he summons you and he invites you and he says, it's you. It's you, not the neighbor next to you, not the one behind you or in front of you. It's you. I invite you to come and follow. I love it. Jesus, it says he sees him. You see, it's not just a, a quick glance. It's actually a word that was used. He fixes his attention on him. He turned his attention towards him. He, Matthew got his attention. Matthew drew him in, as it were, just with the fact of seeing him. He's passing by, and the Bible says Jesus saw him and then summoned him. The seeing is so important. You know, this morning, I want you to know that Jesus sees you. Where you are, he sees you. Whatever going on in your life, he sees you. The pain and hurt that you carry, he sees you. The disappointment, he sees you. The broken dreams and hopes, he sees you. The anguish and pain that you carry, he sees you. In your celebrations and in your fantastic time, in your self-reliance, he sees you. In your isolation and separation and doing your own thing, he sees you. He sees you this morning. His eye is towards you. His heart is towards you. His compassion is towards you. Wherever you are and whatever you're doing, he sees you today. The invitation to come follow is preceded by the reality that he sees you. I remember the first day that I saw Elizabeth. I'd seen her lots of times. She passed by. We were in the same school. But we were at a YWAM. YWAM were up in Aberdeen, in Fraserburgh, sorry. And they were doing a mission out in a little village called Rose Harty. And she was out there, and I brought my little youth group. And I was sitting at the back, and she was sitting over there. And I remember it was over there because I saw her over there. And when I saw her in Rose Harty, my hearty rose. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And my hearty has been rising for the last 46 years. Why? Because I saw her. Jesus sees you today. Don't ever think that his look and his gaze has bypassed you. Don't ever think because you may have lived a life like Matthew and, and felt as though they're disqualified. He sees you today because he loves you today. But he does more than see you. He says to, to, to Matthew, he summons him. He says, come, follow me. Come and follow. Leave what you're doing. Leave the trajectory that your life is on. Put it to the side and come and follow me. Take the, the, the bold step to follow me for the rest of your life. Will you walk with me, he's saying. Will you walk on the same road? The road, the word he uses is come and join me on the same road that we are walking together. And he summons him. Uh, when I was a, a doctor, there was always men in dark suits arriving at our front door. Those men in dark suits always carried summonses for me to attend court. Uh, it was because when I worked as a police surgeon, you, you'd go and witness a, a whole bunch of things. You'd be involved in stuff. And then that'd be followed by a criminal a criminal. A, charge would be made and there would be a court case and men in dark suits were then invited to go and get Duthie to come to be a witness because he might be an expert witness. He might have something to say. And they would always arrive at our door. I'm never sure what people in the neighbors must have thought when all these men in dark suits used to come and ding dong the front bell and here was another piece of paper being passed on. It was a summons. It was an invitation. It was more than an invitation, I guess, but it was an invitation to come to court and be and do and fulfill what I was called to do. God has got a summons. Jesus has a summons for each one of us today, an invitation to come and be who he's called you to be, to come and fulfill what he's put within you, to come and be the person that he's asked you to do. And he says to, to Matthew, come follow me. I love it. Jesus sees you. Jesus summons you. But Jesus saves you today. He's the one. We've sung about it already. 
And Matthew would have already realized he was full of gratitude. He gathers all his mates, all his friends, and he, he, a bunch of others that are gathered. And we read the story, and they're all there in that leaving party. He throws a leaving party to celebrate that he's leaving the pathway of life that he's walked on, and he's going to follow Jesus. He's going to put aside the journey he's been on and find somebody who says, come, follow me. G Matthew knew he'd been rescued from a path that was taking him nowhere. I trust that all of us, or many of us, in the room today know we've been rescued from a path that was taking us nowhere, that was taking us to a dark place, taking us to an empty place, taking us to a place of no hope. I trust we're all grateful today and gratitude, because, but grateful because we've been rescued today. Jesus said, hey, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, it's those who are sick. I'm happy to say I was sick in my sin, and Jesus saved me. For all of us in the room today, we can say thank you like Callum has already invited us because he sees you. He summons you, but he saves you. Praise God. That's our God. See, to be walking with Jesus and be moving from followership to partnership, Jesus is wanting to take Matthew and all these other disciples on a journey. He says, if you're going to move from being a follower to being a partner, where I'm going to invest in you and, 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 and encourage you and allow you to send you out to the world, there are some steps that I need you to, to experience. There are some things I need you to see. And over the next two chapters, in chapter 2 and chapter 3, Jesus on the journey around the lakeside goes through a couple of incidences that actually reveal to the disciples, to the followers, ah, okay, these are the implications for walking with Jesus. This is what it means. Number one, it means if we need to be those who are applying to our lives new pliability. Applying to our lives new pliability. Pliability, you know that quality. It's a quality uh, that allows us to be flexible, to bend, to be formed or shaped or molded, to become that which somebody else wants us to be. Jesus wants his followers to know that following means you and I need to be men and women who are pliable, willing to be shaped and molded by God's plan, willing to be shaped and molded by God's purposes, willing to be shaped and molded and flexible to become the men and women that God needs you and I to be in this 21st century for the life that he's given us. A verses 18 to 20, to follow head on the heels of this party. And the, 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 uh, the religious leaders come to Jesus' disciples and say, why don't you disciples. Why doesn't Jesus' disciples fast like John's disciples or the Pharisees? You know what fasting is like. We encourage it here in the life of the church. Fasting is making that decision to deny ourselves or to limit the consumption, whether it's food or whether it's water or whether it's something else. It's, it's that moment where you say, I'm going to remove the power that the, my hunger or my thirst has on me, and I'm going to put, turn my attention to focus on God. I'm going to deny the physical desires within me that the spiritual desire may rise. I may become physically weaker, but I intend to become spiritually stronger as I go on that journey of fasting. Fasting is actually a great thing for all of us to do, but there's nothing in the New Testament that says you must fast. Jesus encourages it. Jesus says even in this story that when he leaves and there's no, the bridegroom has gone, as it were, the celebration moments are gone, then is a time to mourn and to fast, to fix our attention again on Jesus, to fix our attention on God. But it's done, it's fasting should be out of a heart of liberation, not obligation. And the reality here is in this context, fasting had become an outward expression of spirituality. The, the people were now fasting every Monday and every Thursday. It was now part of the ritual and tradition in which they lived. It was undertaken in a practice that engaged to show the world outside how spiritual you are, to show the world what kind of person you were. It was all about external performance, the ritual practice, the way in which a man and hopefully God's approval was sought all through doing stuff, all through living and, and behaving in a particular way. You know, when I was a boy, there were so many external rules that were placed upon my family and me personally and how we would, would express this following Jesus. I, I, it was amazing that I actually emerged out of that reality. I remember one of the strong realities that I was taught and told was I was, must never go into the cinema the cinema is a place where no thinking Christian should ever be found. I don't know if it's because they thought the devil's tail would stick up through the roof or whatever, but that, that was part of the reality for me. I never grew up. And then I remember the day I was 10, 
And my mom and dad said, we're going to go and see The Sound of Music. And I thought, no, it can't be. You've already told me that the boundary line for our life, the external, external reality was that we don't go to the movies. And so I remember parking the car. We came through from Fraserburgh, and we parked the car in the Rose Street car park. And I'm sure there must be two skid marks along Union Street still as I was dragged with my heels, crying and screaming by my mom and dad into this cinema. I didn't know what I was going to experience. I was full of fear. It was the sound of music, but I was full of fear. I didn't know where that was. And I was so overtaken. I'm still got post-traumatic stress disorder. I'm still in counseling <laughs> for that moment. Here am I telling you 50 years later of an incident that took place. It was such a powerful incident because there was so much of my Christian life was on the external reality that was being expected of me. The external things that I was supposed to do. And into this setting walks Jesus saying, no, if you're going to be walking with me, then you need to apply new pliability. You need to apply a new flexibility, a new willingness to be molded. You see, Jesus has already come in Matthew, Mark 1, 15. We've already read it. He says, here I am, it's not about external performance. It's not about what we present on the outside. It's not even about our daily practice or our ritual. It's actually about what's going on in the inside. And Jesus wants you and I to understand. He says, I have come in Mark 1, 15. The kingdom of God is near. It's time for you to repent and believe. Repent is the word metanoia, which means change your mind. Our actions come from our thoughts. And Jesus is saying, I need you to change your thinking about, how you're, about what it means to be a disciple what it means to, to follow Jesus. And he says, it, actually, it, with Jesus, if we're going to be those, it's realizing that following Jesus and walking on the same road with Jesus is, is relational. It's relational. It's about making a connection with God. It's not about the confirmation to rules and regulations. It's about being in that relationship with God, finding Him as our Heavenly Father, finding Him as the, the one that has expressed his love to you and to me. Finding the one who sees you. It's relational. It's also unconditional. I love it. It's a reality that's unmerited favor and grace and mercy. Received not by our, 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 our actions, not by the fulfilling of law, but by a God who looks at you and me so undeserving and yet says, you know what? Following me is all unconditional to you. The invitation to Matthew was totally unconditional. It was nothing about how he needed to change and become somebody different. It was, Matthew, come follow me. And Jesus is telling the people here, actually, you know, it's, it's following me is a relational experience. It's an unconditional experience. It's an internal experience. It's an inside job. It's a change of our heart on the inside, not the presentation of our life on the outside. It's not about our behavior modification. It's about internal heart transformation. Hey, so many of us have maybe spent so many years trying to do things on the outside, trying to find, find God's approval, trying to find approval from men and women because of what we're doing on the outside, all the stuff we're doing. And Jesus is trying to say to them by the illustration of fasting, actually, you know what? It's what goes on in the inside. It's a personal encounter with Jesus that makes all the difference. He's not saying that the practice of fasting and self-denial shouldn't be done. Hear me correctly. He's not saying that. But he is saying that when we count it as being adding brownie points in the journey of following Jesus, then he's saying, no, no. Walking and talking with Jesus is about what goes on in the inside. He paints a couple of lovely pictures. One of, of fresh wine inside an old wineskin. The reality, the vitality and the life of that, that fresh wine, all the, the, the bubbles and the froth and the activity would have cracked and broken an old hard wineskin. And the wine would have been spilled and the, and the wineskin would have been broken. And he said, you can't mix the old and the new. It's got to be this new way. He said, you can't put the two together. And he says, who would take a, 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 an, old, a, an old cloth and put a new patch into it? Because the old cloth, done though it is, will break apart. He said, no, you'll lose both. You know, these jeans of mine are fantastic. I just love them. And when I love a pair of jeans, I go and buy as many pairs as I possibly can. And so this is pair number three, I think. But I left pair number two in a premiere in, in, in uh, Dagenham a month ago uh, because they'd become worn out. They were all done. But they were done months ago. And Elizabeth said, chuck them out. And I said, no, no, no. They're, they're, I love my old jeans. 
I love how they feel. I love how I, I sit into them, and I love how they... MD, no, MD with me. Some, give me some support. <laughs> ah, come on, I love it. Thank you. There's a few of us out here. And so, so as I normally do, I went to my Polish friends on Rose Street, and they're fantastic people, and they can make something from nothing. And I said, could you patch these jeans? Because there was a hole where there shouldn't be a hole. And I said, could you patch these jeans? They said, sure, we'll patch these jeans. And so they, I spent more money on the patch than actually the jeans cost. But it doesn't matter because it's the old things that I love. huh? It's the comfy things that we love. It's the old life that we love. And I, I did that and I patched them and it was great for a wee whiley. And they were just fantastic. And it was a bit uncomfortable walking a little bit. But nonetheless, they were great. Most of the time they were comfortable. And I'm down there in Dagenham uh, representing Assemblies of God and representing you and me. And I'm, I'm teaching them on leadership principles and I'm getting excited and I'm moving I hear <laughs> and they're all sitting there and I think they didn't hear that I'm sure they didn't hear that so you know they, you, you come back and you stand at the <laughs> you stand still <laughs> but you see what was illustrating was the I, I left them in the premier and somebody I hope somebody benefited from my old my old jeans maybe but Jesus is telling them you know, he's not come to patch up the old life. He's not come to just bring a better version of yourselves, of ourselves. That's not what he's done. He's bringing a new robe of righteousness for each one of us, a new right standing. It's got nothing to do with how good we are, how, how uh, adherent we are, how busy we are. It's got nothing to do with that. It's got everything to do with his love and his compassion and his grace and his mercy and his favor. And he's saying, I've come to give you a new robe of righteousness. I've come to give you a new garment of praise, not the, the spirit of heaviness, but a new garment of praise. I love it. You see, he says, you can't mix the old ritual with the new reality. And for all of us in the room, if we're going to be followers of Jesus, come on, let's get a handle on this. It's the internal work that God wants to do in our lives. It's not about the external life that we live. It's not about how we show and what we do and how we, we speak to this person, we deal with that person, how we do what we're going to do. No, it's about how we are on the inside. God wants to change you and I on the inside and not the outside. There's a reality that all of us, come follow me. Let's be walking with Jesus, but as we do, we need to be applying a new pliability. Number two, we need to be complying in our lives to a new priority. Most of us in the room really want to be following Jesus. We've experienced his salvation. We know what it's like to have sins forgiven. Our past is taken care of. Uh, to know every day that there's mercy and grace that's available for us. Most in the room, I'm quite sure, have a desperate heart that says, I want to follow you, Jesus, with all my heart and all my life and all my strength and all my soul. We want to, to, to please the Lord because he's done so much for us. We're so grateful for what he's done for, for each one of us in the room. So we're desperate to say, when he call comes and says, follow me, yes, that's me, count me in. I want to follow you. For some, the challenge is we got pulled into that reality that our journey with Jesus is crammed with things that we need to do, things we need to stop doing, things we need to do better. There are meetings we need to be at, courses we need to take, groups we need to join, activities we need to do, people we need to get alongside, special times we need to be present, special gatherings we mustn't miss, priorities that we need to place. And very quickly, you know, in our desire to follow Jesus with all our life, we get to, well, there's prayer meeting on a Monday, then there's maybe cleaning or maintenance or a growing opportunity on a Tuesday, and maybe a connect group or a growing opportunity on a Wednesday, and maybe Alpha or another opportunity to grow on a Thursday, and maybe a serving possibility on a Friday, and maybe another opportunity to grow somewhere with some grow group on a Friday. Then there's a catching of our breath on a Saturday, and then we're found on Sunday, and where there's time for us to worship and to connect with each other and to be together around God's Word. And then, of course, it's Monday again, and off we go. See, Jesus found a couple of locations beside the lakeside to highlight if we're going to be walking with him. Then it's not so much about what we do, and it's not so much about when we do, but it's about who we do anything with. And he wants to try to present to, to people through these two incidents on a Sabbath, on a Saturday, on the special day for the Jews. He wants to say to them, you know what? It's about who you relate to him. It's all important. It's not about what you're doing and what you're not doing, who you're with and who you're not with, where places you need to be, where you need to be seen, what you need to be doing. 
See, the Sabbath, we, you, know, you and I know, the Sabbath was a very special day. It was a great day. It was a day established by, by God back in Genesis chapter 2 when he established the, the pattern of life for human beings. He'd illustrated it himself as he'd worked for six days, and the Bible says that on the seventh, he rested because he'd completed his work. And for you and for me, he wants to establish there is a cadence and a rhythm to life that if we continue and live by it, then we'll be healthy human beings. It's a, a rhythm of work and then rest and some restoration and then return to work and then rest and restoration and then return to work and then rest and then restoration and return to work. That's a reality for each one of us that God wants to, to put into our lives that place, that space of rest an invitation for us to rest. But again, what had happened in these days, the Sabbath had become a day full of what you could do and what you couldn't do. Where you could go, where you couldn't go. What you were required to do and what you're forbidden to do. And the result was this, such a crazy complex system of external behaviors. Let me just read one or two to you. A tailor couldn't carry his needle because it was work. A scribe couldn't carry his pen. A student couldn't carry his books. You'd only enough ink to write two letters of the alphabet could be carried in a pen. A letter couldn't be sent, clothes couldn't be examined or shaken out before being putting on because maybe an insect might be killed in the process. And if an insect was killed, that would be work. You couldn't set a fire because that was work. You couldn't put out because that was work. Cold water could be poured into warm water, but you couldn't put warm water into cold. Women, listen to this one. You're forbidden to look in the mirror. Because if you saw a white hair, you might just be tempted to pull it out. And that's work. And so you can't do it. That's what the Sabbath had got to. That's what they were doing. It wasn't rest. It was actually fulfilling all manner of things. And Jesus comes and says, actually, I need you to comply with some fresh priorities. I need you to come and, and behave in a different way. Be different men and women. If you're going to follow me, it's not about what you do. It's about who you're with. And he says to them, Let's pull some corn and get some eats and eat some stuff on a Sunday. He goes to the, 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 the synagogue and here's a man with a, some significant neuromuscular problem. He's got a withered hand. And he invites the man to stand up and then to stretch forth his hand. And Jesus heals the man on a Sunday, on a Sabbath day, on a Saturday. And Jesus then says to him, you see, here's the reality in, in chapter 3, verse 27. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. What's Jesus trying to say to you and to me today? He said, walk with me. But if you walk with me, you need to realize there's a new way of living. You need to walk with me. There's a new way of living in grace. There's a new way of living in mercy. There's a new way that you need to, to, to not mix the old with the new. You need to have that freshness and zeal and joy in your life. You need to have that sense of forgiveness, forgiveness of sin and gratitude. As we we're talking about today, you need to have that in your life. But he says there's also a complying with a new priority. You need to recognize that I am Lord of every area of your life. It's not about what you do. It's not about where you do it. It's not about when you do it. It's not about more meetings and about more prayers and about no, more uh, reaching other people. It's about more this and more that and more the next thing. No, it's about spending time with him. It's in acknowledging that he is Lord of every area of our life. He was demonstrating, I'm, I'm Lord of your supply. Whatever you need, I will supply. I am Lord of your sicknesses, whatever your sickness, whether it's a Saturday, whether it's a Sunday, whether it's a Tuesday, or whether it's a Friday, I am the one who can provide for your sickness. He says, I am the Lord of your future. I'm the Lord of your Sabbath. If we're walking with Jesus, it calls on you and me to apply new pliability to our lives. It's a complaint to a new priority in our lives. And as we finish this morning, here's the reality. If we're moving from followership to partnership, let's be like those disciples who are replying with our lives to new proximity. Replying with our lives to new proximity. In verse 13 it says, Jesus leaves the lakeside, makes his way up the mountain, once again finds that place of solitude, that solitary place where in Matthew it says he prays all night to arrive at who are the ones he's going to call out of followership into partnership. He's got many that are now following him. And a journey together that he must Reply to all of us, get that invitation. Today, God wants to put that invitation to each one of us again. Come, follow me. Come close to me. Come to that place of proximity. You see, what he, he says is, come close to me that you might be with me, 
and that I might send you and that you might go with authority. Jesus is looking to say to each one of us today, it's a call to proximity, that they might be with him, come close, that we might spend time in his presence, catch his heart, hear his voice, understand the Lord's why as well as what. Sometimes we're overtaken by the what we must do rather than understanding and getting a a sense of what is God's heart on this? What is he saying to me? What are the whispers that he is? Who is God to me? And so there's an invitation for us to come and orientate ourselves and bring our attention towards Jesus. When is the last time that you spent time with him alone? When's the last time that you turned everything off and said, I'm going to be in your presence, Lord? When he says, come, that you might be with me. That's his prime reality that he wants for his followers, that you and I might be with him in the place of proximity. You know, I love my compass. When you get lost, I used to do a lot of hill walking. When I get lost, you knew that the compass would always return to true north. And Jesus is saying to the disciples, there is a true north that is in my presence. There's a true north that is when you're close to me. There's a true north when you're in my proximity, in the, in the area beside me. Psalm 16, 8 says, I have set the Lord, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I've set the Lord always before me because he is my right hand and I shall not be moved. And Jesus wants to say to every one of us today, let me call you and invite you that we might be with him. To be with him means we need to craft time, make time, find time, discover time, prioritize time that says, you know what, I need to be in your presence. He says, because it's there that there's an opportunity. It's in his proximity that we find opportunity. He says, I want you to be with me that I might send you. Here's what partnership looks like. Partnership looks like coming and hearing the heart of the Lord coming and hearing his priorities, what's on his heart, and then being sent out in response to that. He says, I, I want to send you that I might, you might be with me, that I might send you. There's an opportunity that's available for each one of us in the room today. See, being sent is very much from saying, is very different from saying, I'll go. Many people have desires to go and do something. Many people have got uh, passion inside to go and fulfill this and go and do that and go here and go there. But are you sent or are you just going? Isaiah comes before God in Isaiah chapter 6 and we know the story. He sees God in all his glory. And he says, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips, living in a people of unclean lips. And the angel comes and cleanses him again. He gets that sense of being made whole again. And God says, who will go for me and who can I send? And Isaiah responds and he says, here am I, but send me. He doesn't say, here am I, but go. You see, when God brings opportunity for each one of us, opportunity is given in the context of proximity. He wants you and I to know him and have his heart, understand what is his, his priorities before he says to, now I know that you know who I am and I will send you out to go and do what I need you to do. So many people are going and doing stuff. But are we sent or are we going? Proximity follows on to opportunity, but opportunity comes then with authority. And he says, come close. I need you to come and be with me that I might send you and you that will carry the authority to go and cast out demons. To have influence. To have dominion over the world in which we are. And I... I'm quite sure that for most of us in the room today, our heart's desire is to have influence over the the journey of our life, influence over the challenges in our life, influence over the dark things in our life. Then Jesus says, influence is available for you. Authority is available for you. Authority comes with the opportunity when you're sent and you get sent because you've spent time in his presence. And Jesus wants to say to you, to me today, you know, if we're looking for productivity in our life, productivity, I believe, is a byproduct of proximity plus opportunity plus authority. 
because it's at the back of that that the disciples go and we hear, we'll hear later on in the series when they come back and say, even the demons hear when, and respond. People are being sick, are being healed. Oh, that God would move in this community of men and women for our city. Callum reminded us in, the, in our early morning time together today, there are 230,000 people in our city of Aberdeen. 1% perhaps go to church every Sunday. What happens for that 99%? Oh, that you and I would be sent by God out into our city to transform our city, to bring transformation to people, that lives would be changed, that families would be brought back together, that brokenness would be healed. I believe that day is coming, but it starts here as we say, I'm going to follow you, God. I'm going to step aside from the journey that I'm walking, and I'm going to walk with you. Walking with Him in partnership with Him looks like this. It says, come close to me and find the place of proximity. I have plenty of opportunity that I will give to you, but proximity leads to opportunity. Opportunity comes with authority, and as we do and respond to what God wants to do, as we put the priority of what He has in His heart, and who knows what God is going to do in and through each one of us today. You know what? Nobody in this room is excluded from his invitation today. Nobody in this room is excluded from his summons today. Come, follow him. There's nobody is outside that reality. Nobody is outside that invitation. No matter what has gone on in your world. No matter what's happened in your history. Jesus wants to say to each one of us again today, come, follow me. Come close. Find the place of proximity that I might offer you once again the opportunity and give you the authority to go out and make a difference in this world. For some, it may well be today, it's a reminder. I remember that call and I've laid that call down and I need to pick that call up. For others today, it may well be, you know what, I need to shift the priorities. I'm so busy doing that I have no time for being with God. Maybe for some that's your reality. Maybe for others today, it's maybe the first time that you've ever heard God say, is he actually looking at me? He knows what I've done in my life. He knows where my life has gone. He knows the decisions I've gone, I've made. He knows how I've drifted. And yet he still invites me again to come follow him. Yes, he does. Hey, I would love to pray for people today if it's in these last few moments. Maybe today, this is your day where you're going to say, yes, I want to follow God today. Yes, today is the day I want to get off the path I'm on and walk with Jesus once again. You know, if that's you, stuff's going on in your mind and your heart, memories, disappointments, hopes and dreams. Let the Lord speak to you this morning and reply his invitation to proximity. Can we bow our heads just for a moment? We always love this opportunity. Just for people to have that moment of making a peace with God. We know that these moments are not what is going to determine the trajectory of your life or the the walking with Jesus for the rest of your life. It's the daily walk with Him. But these moments sometimes cement something in your mind. We would love certainly to put something in your hand that may help you. But we'd particularly love to pray for you that God would give you strength and courage to continue, keep on following. And so as we finish today, wherever you find yourself in Jesus' invitation, we want to give you that invitation to respond to today. If that's you in here today and you're saying, Ian, could you just include me in that prayer? And maybe we can talk more later. If that's you, then I would love just for you to put your hand up as high as you can so that our folks can get a, a Luke's gospel into your hand that will help you and maybe help in any other ways. Are, is there anybody in the room today? And that's your reality. Just put your hand high in the sky. Some of the team will see you and we'll do that. I'm not going to prolong these moments. Thank you. Thank you. Any others in the room today? Never want to quickly pass by these opportunities. Wonderful. Come on, let's all stand, can we? Heavenly Father, we thank you today. We thank you, Lord, for those that have said today, yes, they want to follow you. We thank you for your invitation that's always available. Come, follow 
Lord, we've praised you, God, that you've given us the invitation for all of our life to walk with you, to come close to you, that we might be with you, that we might be like you, and Father, that we might go and do the things that you do. Father, we praise you today. Lord, for the stuff that gets in our way, Lord, we ask your forgiveness. Lord, help us to reorientate our lives, Lord, and to, to indeed work with a fresh filling of your Holy Spirit today, fresh thinking in our minds, Lord, today. Father, for those who have made decisions, God, to, to pursue you with all their heart and life. Lord, to walk in step with you. We pray, God, that you be with each one, Father. Give them courage. Give them strength. And for all of us, Lord, as we seek to keep on following you, help us, God, every day. Speak to us every day. Encourage us, God, but challenge us, Lord, in the things that take us away off the path from you. Lord, we want to be following you and walking with you for every day of our life. We pray, Lord, for each one of us, we would set you before us, that you would be our guiding compass throughout all of our lives. We praise you, Lord. We give you thanks in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen.